I always appreciate the opportunity to talk to the children because some of the churches I go to just before I speak, the best part of the congregation will walk out. That's the children. So it's good to be able to uh, talk to the boys and girls. And uh, I know, boys and girls, in this church, you have been really involved in the new ship, saving your coins for the new ship. What's that program called? Remembers the name of the program. Huh? Vera, what's the name of the program? <laughs> El Capitano. Here is my uh, personal assistant, the secretary. My wife asked, since she has heard me preach a few times, if she could stay home and watch songs of praise. <laughs> but she sends her greetings. Uh, El Capitano is a program that the children in your church uh, or fellowship have engaged in. Did Ivan ever get down here? We had to uh, Kenny Gunn is here. Yeah. Whoa, Kenny Gunn. He's on the ship right now, but we hope he'll come back soon since he's the leader of the team there in uh, Forest Hill. Boys and girls, we've got this big globe. Bet you don't have one that big, do you? And we've got this global jacket to go with it doesn't look very good on me. It's better on fat, you know, global people. But uh, there it is, the whole world. And I just want to remind you of something that I hope you'll never forget. And that is that God is still in the business of sending out missionaries. Now, we know some people say, well, we're all missionaries. Well, that's true. In a sense, we're all missionaries. Everybody who knows Jesus should be talking to other people about Jesus. You can do that even now. But in the Word of God, we see, especially in Acts chapter 13, they were having a prayer meeting, and the Holy Spirit said to Paul and Barnabas, I'm sending you out. And then they laid hands on them, and they sent Paul and Barnabas out as missionaries. And I want you to consider the possibility when you grow up, it's going to come quicker than you think, of being a missionary. Maybe even working on one of our ships. <coughs> we have two big ships and now we're going to get another one and you're helping us pay for that. And we're going to be looking for people not just next year, but if the Lord tarries, we know the Lord may come back in 10 years, 20 years from now, when you're older, we're going to be looking for people to work on the ship. Now, if you told me that when you grow up you're planning to be a doctor... <laughs> I would just say, praise the Lord, we need Christian doctors. That's wonderful. If you told me I'm going to be a nurse, I would say, praise the Lord. If you said, I'm going to be a computer programmer, I'd say, praise the Lord, we need, com we need computer programmers. We actually need some in our work. And we hear about all these careers. And in school, you'll hear some of the boys and girls and teachers talking about these careers. What you can be when you grow up. I have my friend here, Brian. Stand up, Brian. Ryan's from South Carolina. What did you study at university? Health. Say it good and loud. Health and exercise science. Health and exercise science. Till I met Brian, I didn't even know there was such a thing. <laughs> so you can you can choose a career and use that health and exercise in your career. What's one possible job that you might get? Uh, physical therapist. Physical therapist. So in the kingdom of God, we're not just looking for preachers and missionaries we're looking for all kinds of people and if we went around we don't have time we could introduce you you're important and we could ask what your career has been that would be very interesting we have some people who are very young they're just uh, preparing in their career we got Roger Hill here well we like to think of him as young he lives near here and well, what is your career Roger I work in the Home Office for Immigration and Asylum on policy. He works in the Home Office. Did you know there's any Christians working in the Home Office on Immigration and Asylum? Somebody else I met uh, works in that area. Maybe it was a letter I read. So we hear about all these different things we can be. Does anybody ever come up to you and say, what are you going to be when you grow up? Does anybody ever ask you that? What do you say? What do you say when somebody asks you that? You can be honest, right? Say you don't know. Don't be afraid to say you don't know. But maybe you said a policewoman. 
<laughs> but about a television star. But what I want you just to remember from our little time with our big globe, we also have this book. You can get your mom and or dad to get this book. Normally it's 10 pounds, but because of Christmas, we're giving it for a fiver. We actually lose money on it. But we don't mind losing money if we can get this book into the hands of children because this is one of the greatest children's books, I think, in the history of Christian literature. Um, boys and girls, as you get this book, you can start reading about different children in the world, like the Niwar children. I bet you never even heard of them. The Niwars. Have you heard of that before? No. The Madinka. Have you heard of the Madinkas? Nice people, the Madinkas, aren't they? Have you ever met a Madinka? There it is. And as you go through this, you'll read about all these different kinds of people, and then you'll read about some of the nations. Let's see. There's Oman. That's a small nation on the Arabian Peninsula. There's uh, Syria. That's over there in the Middle East, north of Lebanon. It's fun to get to know about these countries. Get to know about children around the world and what they're like. We have two grown-up children here from India. Stand up, our two Indian friends, Priti and Pradeep. And, uh, Pradeep is living in England. Priti came over from America. What, what are you studying over there? Oh, clinical psychology. Clinical psychology <laughs> in Wheaton College where Billy Graham went. Thank you. So we have all kinds of people. But we must not forget that being a missionary is also an acceptable career. That's what my wife and I chose when we were only teenagers. And we learned never to think that somebody else is less important. But we've also learned that being a missionary is important. And we need missionaries. People who can go out to some of these other countries where in some cases, boys and girls, the, the church doesn't even exist. If you want to go to church, you couldn't go to church. Because there is no church. And where a lot of boys and girls have never heard the gospel story Living in England, even on television, you hear the gospel story. Sometimes you hear some false stories as well. <coughs> but there are places in the world where people have never heard the gospel story that God sent His Son, His Son lived here, took on the form of a, of a person, and then died on the cross for our sin. So I'm hoping maybe at least one or two of the boys and girls here this morning, maybe at least one, are going to come to me 20 years from now, and you're going to say, I decided to be a missionary. And I am going to be very excited if you do that. Let's just pray together. Lord, I thank you for all the boys and girls here. I thank you that you're going to lead different boys and girls in different ways. And some may be doctors, and some may be business people or bankers, and some may go into clinical psychology, and others may go into exercise science. But we pray that at least one of these children may grow up and be a missionary just like Paul and Barnabas and may launch out to a more difficult part of the world to plant the church and to build the church and to preach your gospel. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's a privilege. It's always a privilege to be able to share the message of, of God's Word. And it's a privilege to minister closer to my own home as I've lived in Bromley Borough for about almost 40 years. It used to be more in the center of Bromley and then we moved over to West Wickham. But we're still in Bromley Borough, though it's also called Kent. And it's amazing how many great churches, small and large, that we have in Kent and in Bromley Borough. And it's amazing to see workers being sent out and I know you've sent out people from your fellowship and some of you represent different uh, fellowships and you come here on this uh, Sunday afternoon. I hope you'll stay behind for a few moments. We'd like to give everybody a free book. Either my book, Out of the Comfort Zone, which is my newest book, or one of my older books. You just please take that as a Christmas gift or a New Year's gift, if, even if you just give it away to someone else. All the other books are on a donation basis and 
if you want some idea of what donation would be good, there'll be people, people there to uh, help you out. We have Operation World. Now, a lot of people don't touch this because it looks too big. But it's a book you will use the rest of your life as a reference book. And it will pay for itself again and again through the valuable material. Prayer requests on every nation in the world. In fact, I always urge people to get at least two. Because as soon as you get one, somebody comes along and they want it. They see it in your house and they want it. In certain, certain cultures, by the way, when someone says something like that, you have to give it to them, according to the culture. Uh, doesn't seem to work so well here in Britain. <laughs> but it's good to have an extra copy of Operation World. We already talked about the brilliant children's edition. We also have a book that's just come out, stories from around the world, and even when it's sold in a bookshop, it's only £1.50. And the £1.50 is being donated to World Missions. The first book put £50,000 into World Missions. That was only a pound. We may have a few of those as well. But this is part two. And there's a CD that goes with it. I think that's another pound or two. And you may want to pick that up. I'm especially trying to challenge people to become more uh, aware of the global crisis of HIV and AIDS. And we're distributing all over the world a book by Dr. Patrick Dixon, AIDS and You. Some who have our uh, prayer letter my special projects prayer letter, you know we featured that. We're trying to put it in different languages, and it's a big project, and we need your prayers. Actually, Dave and I this afternoon were just looking at a 15-minute video I did about HIV and AIDS a few days ago, uh, trying to decide just uh, how we're going to use it in our effort to get the message out. 40 million people have HIV or AIDS. Millions of children are now orphans as a result of this virus. I saw uh, an announcement in the subway, in the underground in London a few days ago. The number of people infected in the UK has doubled. It has doubled since 1999. And sometimes people carry this virus and they do not even know it. And they infect other people. And sometimes those people die because this person is carrying the virus. Unfortunately, we've had some people spread the virus who actually knew it, and they're trying to pass a law to equate this with some kind of murder. I don't know if that's going to happen. This is a little booklet we've distributed uh, through the ship ministry in Africa, written especially for people who already have HIV or AIDS. And it shows them that there's hope in Jesus Christ. <coughs> and quite a few people with HIV are coming to Christ in Africa and in other parts of the world. So that's exciting. And books are exciting. And we hope you'll take time to pick up uh, some of these books and to visit with a number of our friends who are here representing many different countries of the world. I'm not going to read another passage of Scripture, but I want you to just think with me about some of the great stories of the Word of God and especially the Bible. I think, for example, of the story of David and Goliath. Why do we have a story like that in the Bible? What, is that just for the children? For Sunday school? No, there are many reasons. But one of the reasons is that God wants us, as His people, to be willing to attempt the impossible. To be willing to attempt that which is difficult. And as we go into a new year, 2004, and that may date our little time together here this afternoon, but whenever it may be, I think we need to be willing to tackle things that are really tough. It's interesting how many Hollywood films are centered around people doing the impossible. One of the latest films is called The Core. Have you seen that film? You probably don't like that kind of film. It's all sort of action. In the core, the whole planet is going to be dest destroyed because the core of the earth, something has gone wrong. And so a team of people, led of course by a woman, that's the way it is these days, is going to get in this special machine, which was invented by man, so there's the balance, and travel <laughs> to the core of the earth. They're going to travel to the core of the earth. Of course, 
humanly speaking, this is impossible, this is ridiculous, but with film, you can do anything. And of course, people, what do they pay 10 pounds to watch this kind of film in the cinema now? 10 pounds, more. I get a senior discount if I go to the uh, cinema. To watch people attempt something that's impossible. How many of you have heard of extreme sports? And some of you are a little older, and uh, this is not really of your generation, though you were into it, including my generation, without having that name. People have always been interested in doing extreme things, in, in extreme sports. But now we have the word. We have a whole phenomenon. We have videos. We have uh, conferences. We have all kinds of things going on all over the world in what's called extreme sports. Even diving without oxygen to the deepest depths of the ocean that any human being has ever gone. Someone just died doing that. In fact, in every area of extreme sports, people have died. They risk their lives. Well, as we go back into the Word of God, we see people risking their lives. Paul talks about risking his life for the sake of the gospel. And we see in the Old Testament people attempting the impossible. Remember uh, Elijah on the mountain? What was he doing? He was taking on all of the prophets. One man was taking on this army of false prophets and he challenged them and he told them they should call down fire there in the book of Kings. They prayed and prayed. They lacerated themselves and called down fire and nothing happened. And then Elijah called down fire, and the fire came down. Even in the New Testament, it refers to God as a consuming fire. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we have an entire chapter of people who are attempting the impossible. Women, it says, who even refused miraculous deliverance because they preferred to give their lives for what they believed. And so the Bible is filled with challenges. It's filled with stories of people taking risks. Not just David and Goliath, but many more. It's filled with stories of people going against the tide. Think of Noah. A lot of this is now portrayed on modern film. You have film of the entire Bible now, more or less. And so you can go watch a movie of Noah. You can... Go watch a movie of uh, Abraham who just launched out from a, a pretty nice situation, not even knowing where he was going. And Noah, of course, is building this ark in the middle of an area where there was no, there was no big lake, there was no big ocean. Uh, people just laughed at it. I remember when I first got the idea for getting a ship for world missions. This is in a converted pub in Bolton, Lancashire, around 1964. And I remember a number of people laughing when I shared this vision. Some already thought that George Verwer was a little crazy, but now they knew. I remember also after the big summer of 1962 when we had about 200 people of challenging a group of people. I think we were in Madrid at a conference and challenging a group of people that next summer, 63, we ought to do 10 times more. And I remember a man writing me a letter, and he felt this was ridiculous. Why do you think next summer, your little new organization that hardly anybody even knows, you should do 10 times as much? Where did you get this 10 times idea? You know, to be honest, I don't know if that came from God or not. God is so merciful. We make mistakes as young people. And God still uh, somehow uh, answers our prayers, seems to accomplish what we're dreaming, what we're praying about. The next summer, He gave us 2,000 people. That was the greatest birth summer in OM's history. And we distributed about 10 times <clears throat> as much literature all across Europe. We had 10 vehicles or 12 vehicles. We got them from scrapyards not far from here. Old vehicles for 50 pounds, 100 pounds. 
went all over Europe. Quite a few of them broke down. In 1963, we had 110 vehicles, almost 10 times as many. Many of them broke down and became little monuments scattered around Europe that we eventually had to collect. So I believe that God is a God who wants us to tackle difficult things. That's why we're concerned about HIV and AIDS. That's why we're trying to do something, though it seems overwhelming. It seems impossible. You remember when the spies came out of the Promised Land and they shared uh, with Moses? And they said, well, we, we feel like grasshoppers. We feel like grasshoppers in their sight. And then Caleb and Joshua were the only ones, they were the only ones that sort of said, let's go up. Let's go up. We can do it. That's what Caleb said. And Joshua said, if the Lord delight in us, He will give us this land. He will give us this land. They were the only two that ever got into the promised land. Now that's all in the way of introduction to what I feel are the ten greatest problem nations that are facing us in the world today. And as we go into this new year, and God has very much put this burden on my heart, I want us to be praying for these ten nations. I want us to be trying to read about them in the newspaper and watching the news on the TV. And when we hear about these nations, we can remember this message that we heard on this Sunday afternoon here on the 28th of December. And we can pray more fervently. We can pray with greater vision, with greater faith. Ten huge problem nations. Now, I must say, this is according to my opinion. Someone else is entitled to their ten most difficult, challenging, impossible nations. Because there are a lot of them out there. But this is my top ten. I don't know if you've ever listened or watched Top of the Pops. <laughs> and uh, there's all kinds of different competition between different groups that are naming their top this and top that. So these are my top ten mega challenging, difficult, seemingly impossible places. Each one of them is different. But most of them have in common that almost nothing is happening in terms of the gospel. That's pretty heavy, right? Most of us here today love Jesus. That's why we're here. We believe the Bible is God's Word. We believe Acts 1.8 When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And that's one of the reasons we're here. I believe we're here growing in God because we're not just satisfied that we are going to heaven, and I hope everybody here knows Jesus, and you know that you're going to heaven, but we're also here because we want to honor God, we want to glorify God, and we want other people to know. And we know right around us here in Bromley Barrow, whether it's Downham, whether it's over the border into Lewisham, this is also a mission field. And we know that God is bringing people here from all over the world. We have some people with us this afternoon who actually work among Muslims in London. Because we have 1.5 million Muslims living in Great Britain. Actually, many more than that now. It is growing so fast. So as I bring your attention to these ten nations, that is in no way to say that we don't have a huge job here. We have a huge job here. We have a tough job here. And a lot of our attention, a lot of our attention living here has to be where? Here. I don't find many people talking about these nations. And so that's one of the reasons I'm talking about them. And because the Apostle Paul himself, later on after he was sent out, said that he wanted to go, he wanted to go where Jesus Christ had never been named. Imagine saying that 2,000 years ago. He had plenty of scope. And I believe God is also today looking for people willing to go where Jesus Christ has hardly ever been named. Actually, missiologically, and my book, Out of the Comfort Zone, is somewhat of a missionary book, 
We don't now so much speak about nations. Though I'm doing that this afternoon because people relate to that. The average person reading the newspaper, watching television, relates to nations. But in fact, missiologically, in terms of world evangelism, we think about people's groups. And even this children's book is uh, giving half of its attention, half of its attention to children, I mean to people's groups, some of them children, and half of the attention to nations. Very interesting. I hope you'll get a copy of that book. The first nation, the first most difficult nation in the world, I classify as number one, and that is the land of Korea. Now that is so strange because South Korea is one of the most evangelized Christian nations in the entire world. And yet we just go across the border where South Koreans are not allowed to go. So they're not sending missionaries there. There may be a few who smuggled in. You have a completely different world where many Christians have been killed. Many are in prison even this afternoon as we sit here. Where there is now a major nuclear threat. Where probably a million have starved to death. Sometimes someone who's traveling with me and, and we miss a meal and I hear the person. I don't think I've heard Brian say this. Thank you much for heard Brian. But others who had this job before you, after missing one meal, they've said to me, I'm starving. Have you ever heard anybody say that in Britain? I'm starving. I prefer the British term, which I only learned when I came here. Oh, I'm feeling a bit peckish. To me, that's a little better than starving to death terminology, which surely must have been born in America, where people do tend to be in alliteration quite a lot. Korea, one of the most challenging, needy nations in the world, politically, sociologically, every other way. And I want to ask you, because we're not going to be together here at all. Will you pray for Korea? Because that's always the first need. And that's one of the reasons I'm sharing this. Because I know that probably most of us here, including myself, are never going to get to Korea. We've been trying and praying about sending our ship there for a long term. I still pray someday it may happen. I was in a meeting in Korea in a big stadium speaking to 80,000 young people. And we gave an invitation. The man behind me after I spoke, spoke Korean, so I'm not exactly sure what he said, but when he gave the invitation, I think 70% of the people stood up. And I found out later, it was partly because he, he gave a challenge about missions, but he included, how many of you would be willing to go to North Korea? And thousands of South Koreans stood in that stadium on that day and said they're willing to go. But so far, that's years ago now, five, six years ago, they've not been able to go. We need more prayer. That God would open this door. There's some cracks. There's some rays of light right now. And I believe we need to put Korea on the top of our prayer list for the year 2004 and beyond. The second toughest and most impossible nation in the world, in my view, is the land of Saudi Arabia. Here it is. You know, even as I speak, we can shoot prayers in the direction of these countries. The Word of God says to pray without ceasing. Now the Arabian Peninsula consists of many countries. I've been in almost all of them and Saudi Arabia. There are special places. There are many wonderful people. And most Muslims are not militant people that want to kill anybody or blow anybody up. And many of them are very peace-loving people and greatly distressed by what some of the people who are, do are doing who claim to be of their same religion. In all these surrounding countries, there's more freedom than in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the heartland of extreme Islam. They have helped birth the Taliban. The roots of the Taliban, the roots of Al-Qaeda, they go back to Saudi Arabia. And Wahhabi Islam, a form of Islam, though they do not generally teach terrorism, that is taking it one step further. And of course, most Wahhabi Muslims of Saudi Arabia are greatly distressed. Yet there's such a great breach of human rights in Saudi Arabia. They do not allow the Bible. They do not allow Christian groups. And it is more or less illegal for a Saudi to become a Christian and they may suffer the death penalty as a result of such a conversion. This is a serious country. Not much is ever done about all of this. Even by the United Nations, 
because of something that's called oil. Bringing some of the most complex political and sociological challenges that the world can ever face. And I would be slow to give some simplistic answer about Saudi Arabia because if the present government, with all of its breaches of human rights, with its sort of family dictatorship, if that collapses, what will take its place in Saudi Arabia? Democracy? I don't think so, friends. So this is a huge prayer challenge. The church is more or less non-existent in Saudi Arabia. Though there are foreigners, the government doesn't even like this, there are foreigners who meet and worship the Lord. And we've heard of secret Saudi Arabian believers. The third most difficult nation in the world has been in the news a lot lately. And that's the land of Libya. The last I heard, there were less than 10 believers. Less than 10 believers among the Libyans. When I talk to most British people about missions, they don't really want to hear much. They immediately, almost always, even Christian leaders, come back on me and say, what about our country? Well, who am I to come in as a foreigner and tell you about your country? You know about your country. You've got a vision for your country. That's why you're here this afternoon. Of course we need to do more. But how do you compare Bromley and all the churches we have and most parts of London with Libya with less than 10 believers with no existing church among the Libyans. There are some foreigners there, expatriates we call them, <laughs> who of course worship the Lord. There is no comparison, my friends. And in my global survey, which I've been involved in for 48 years, Britain is in the top 10 nations in the world in terms of its potential to send out and to finance missionaries. So there's no sense just putting ourselves down or making wrong comparisons just in an effort to try to get people to do more here. We need to do more here, but we need to stick to the truth as we attempt to get people to work hard in Great Britain so that we don't say things that are completely ridiculous. Libya is a forgotten country. Libya has almost no church. In the last week, we've seen a change of mind in Mr. Gaddafi. Do you, know, you think those things just happen? Do you think that's because political muscle comes from America? These things happen because God is sovereign in the affairs of nations, something I've never fully grasped. Do you think it was Blair and Bush that really took care of Saddam Hussein? My Bible says... It's the living God who puts up one king and takes down another. Again, I don't claim to understand it. And we know he uses people. And we know he often uses folly, even stupidity, to accomplish his purposes. Certainly that's true in my own life. So in God's timing, Gaddafi is over. In God's timing, Saddam Hussein, who stood unmovable for decades, he was over. Two weeks ago, it happened. Isn't it exciting to be alive in the world today? Some people are, are able to say things like, Boy, I, I just, I just want to go. I'm just pining to go to heaven. I have to be honest. I'm not wanting to go to heaven yet. I'm willing, I want to be able to say, to live as Christ, to die as gain. But I've got a lot of friends and relatives that are still not saved. I want to try to see more people saved. Especially my own blood, my own Verwer blood. Most of them not Christians, living in the Netherlands, where my father is from, and other parts of the world. And I want to see more happen in Libya before I go to heaven. But of course, not my will. God's will be done. The fourth most difficult, challenging nation in the world is again very difficult, different from these first three. And I'm referring to the land of Sudan. You see it here on my big globe? Now Sudan is different because there are a lot of Sudanese believers. In fact, through the Civil War, which may have taken up to two million people, hundreds of thousands of black African Sudanese have come to Jesus. They have suffered so much, it's just staggering. It's staggering to read about what's been going on in Sudan over the past decade or two. And yet, even while that's been going on, 
There's been relative freedom in the north among the people who are mainly Muslim, and many can consider themselves of Arabic, uh, an Arabic stream. And they've allowed, government has allowed evangelistic meetings, they've allowed churches, they've allowed people to come to Christ, they generally don't kill someone who becomes a believer, and so the church has been growing in Sudan. And yet, it's a nation that has suffered so much. You read about it, and read about how the government's trying to make it more Islamic and have total Sharia law in the whole nation, you realize this is an impossible situation. Probably you are already praying for Sudan because quite a few missions work there. And it is somewhat of an open door. We've had people there for years and the director of our work in the whole Middle East, the man who oversees our whole OM in the Middle East, he is... He is a Sudanese brother. But moving on, we come to my fifth most difficult nation. And that is the land of Iraq. I'm sure you knew Iraq was going to get in there. Is Iraq something that God just put on our hearts since the war or in the last few years? Actually, a group of us gathering in prayer at Moody Bible Institute, one of the birthplaces of OM, it was not even called OM then, one of the main nations that I talked about was Iraq. That's 45 years ago. 45 years of prayer. And only in the last months have we seen freedom to really get on and evangelize Iraq. In fact, that's such stunning news that a major article in today's or yesterday's Daily Telegraph full hat page is about the evangelization of Iraq. I never thought I'd read that in the Daily Telegraph. And it isn't all positive in what it is saying. But it brings out what we already know. This is a phenomenal open door and when the Americans leave it will probably not be as open as it is right now. As this freedom to distribute literature and bring in tons of Christian books and Bibles from various parts of the world. Yet as we read the news, as we see what's going on in Iraq, we realize Christians are being persecuted now, some of them more than under Saddam Hussein. We understand this is a big challenge. This is a, humanly speaking, impossible situation. There are only a few dozen churches in the whole nation. Only a tiny, tiny percentage of Christians in a great sea of both Sunni and Shiite Muslims. Would you make a greater commitment? I'm sure you're already praying. But would you make a greater commitment to pray for Iraq? And if you're in, in your mind right now, you think, well, this isn't really so relevant for me. I've got enough problems in my own world, in my own family, in my own job. This, these distant nations is not really rele relevant for me. I would ask you to think of not what's relevant for you, but what is on the heart of God. What is on the heart of God? If God had not sent missionaries to Great Britain a long time ago, you would not be saved. You would not be here. You would be on the highway to eternal separation from God. How does that sound? But because someone prayed and missionaries came to these islands in very early days of the Christian church, and you became one of the strongest churches in the world, sending out thousands of missionaries, and sending out missionaries also within Britain, like the London City Mission in every part of the city. That's why many of us are here. We need to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. We need to put ourselves in Iraq, in a village where there's no church, where they never heard the gospel, and pray. Would you want anybody to come? to your village where there's no church and bring you the gospel so that you can have eternal life? I dare to say that if you were in that village and you had the knowledge that we have here, you'd be a greater person of prayer than maybe you are right now. And then the sixth nation is the nation of Afghanistan. The vision for this nation came on my heart about 47 years ago reading a book by Oswald J. Smith called Passion for Souls. He talked about this nation in the preface and called it one of the largest last bastions of Satan's territory. There was no church at that time. There were no believers. And here we are 45 years later. There is still no functioning church in Afghanistan. 
Doesn't that stir your heart as a believer? There are individual believers. We have reason to believe there may be some Bible studies going on. Some literature is going out. There are over 200 workers there who love Christ from other parts of the world who are there in relief and development as tent makers. Many of them serving often with very little opportunity to talk about Jesus. I believe Afghanistan still stands as one of the greatest challenges to the body of Christ anywhere in the world and would ask you to pray for that country. I just talked to somebody from Kabul on the phone a few days ago and I know they are praying for more workers. And it often takes training, it takes preparation, it takes language learning to be an effective person in a place like Afghanistan. You may be able to go on a short-term trip before that and then go back later on. And then the seventh most difficult nation in the world, I wonder if you could even guess. I doubt if anybody would come up with this next country. It's the land that's no longer considered a country, but it's a country in my view, the land of Tibet. Just north of Nepal, where I had the privilege of living for a number of years, a lot of the praying I did for the first ship when the ship ministry was born was there in Kathmandu, Nepal. And as we prayed a lot for Nepal and worked in Nepal, we've seen one of the greatest examples of church growth anywhere in Asia, as there are now hundreds of thousands of Nepali believers worshiping, worshiping Jesus. And I've read recently that some of these Nepalis are now thinking about Tibet. There are already Tibetans living in Nepal, just as there are Tibetans living in Europe, especially in Switzerland. And I believe this nation is one of the toughest, biggest challenges it's locked behind the communist door, and then it's locked behind the extreme Buddhist door. How are we going to reach Tibetans? There's almost no literature. There are almost no scriptures in Tibetan. There are almost no missionaries whatsoever. And as I've taken surveys, I don't find anybody even planning to go there. In fact, my surveys, which I've stopped taking in different churches, about whether anybody even prays for Tibet, shows that hardly anybody anywhere prays for Tibet. It's a forgotten country. Maybe when they get to it, in Operation World, where it has a couple of pages, or maybe one page, they pray. So I'm asking you, would you pray for the land of Tibet that was raped and almost destroyed by communist China so many years ago, where there was so much suffering. And yet, where now there is somewhat of an open door, there are a few workers getting in there, some short-termers, some are learning the language, some are working on literature projects. I'm encouraged that now is the hour for Tibet. And then my eighth country, that's going to really surprise you. Because my eighth country, when I mention it, most people have never even heard of it. It's a very small country, but because we're here on an island, or islands, British Isles, I thought you'd be interested in at least one island being in my top ten most difficult nations. Wouldn't that be fair to the islands? So I chose Socotra. Socotra. Where in the world is Socotra? Can anybody show me on the globe where Socotra is? Where is it? Over here in the Pacific? A lot of islands out there, right? Socotra is a small island right here off the coast of Somalia. Somalia probably would be number 11 on my list, but we don't have time. So I chose Socotra because as far as I know, there is not a single believer yet in Socotra. Up till recently, there were no Christian workers. There are now a few who got there. I knew a brother named Ray Lynch who was with me when we first got the idea of the first ship. And I remember him challenging me about using the ship to go to the islands of the world. And the ships have been to many islands, but we have never been to Socotra. The Maldives are almost as difficult. And we've been to the Maldives. We were not able to do much. And some workers recently were all put in jail there and then thrown out. But Socotra is much tougher than the Maldives. So do you like hard places? Are you willing to pray for nations that nobody cares about? Except maybe Jesus? Where no missionaries are planning to go? Where almost no mission society has any strategy whatsoever? Praise God. The Red Sea Mission Team has a strategy for Socotra. Praise God for Lionel Gurney and men like him who are part of the great influence on my own life in connection with my vision for the Muslim world. And then my ninth nation is the nation of Iran. 
Now Iran has a small church. And the church is growing. And Iran is a nation that has suffered so much. And we all, this afternoon, sit in the wake of this earthquake, which just happened a few days ago, and it's taken at least 25,000 people into eternity. Now if you can hear that and remain blasé, would you write me a paper? Would you send me an email? How to stay blasé, nonchalant, indifferent when 25,000 people have been wiped out by an earthquake? Because I can't do it. I've been trying for the last couple of days and I find it difficult. And I want you to pray for the people that are in Iran right now rescuing those who are in the earthquake. Some may still be alive. And then caring for all those who are bereaved and attempting to rebuild that city of Ban there uh, south of the main capital of Tehran. It's not even listed as a city on my globe, but it's there in Iran. By the way, on the positive side, Iranians around the globe are one of the main groups of people coming to Jesus. Isn't that exciting? There are dozens of Iranian believer churches. Whether you go to London or New Delhi or, or San Francisco or Karachi, Iranians are coming to Christ. And I believe it's a result of prayer. Because for a number of reasons, a lot more people have been praying for Iran than some of these other countries that I have mentioned. And then my final nation, the tenth most difficult, challenging nation in the world today, is up here in Central Asia. And again, it's surrounded by nations where there's new open doors, there are people coming to Christ, there are new churches. We're working in almost all those places. Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Turkmen, uh, Tajikistan. But the nation that has been left out, I wonder if you could guess it, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan. It's, uh, it's a little hard to find on my map here. The, uh, the name has been sort of erased. This globe has been around for a couple of years, so you can't read it. But it's there north of Iran, Turkmenistan. The leader of that country is a complete fanatic. And he is against the Christian church. The Baptist church has suffered there. That pastor has been put in prison. Our own workers have had to leave. There may be a few people there with some kind of job incognito, but this is a fanatic, unreached nation that is getting very little attention. So there are my ten nations for the year 2004. I bet most of us weren't thinking along those lines when we started today, were we? But I hope as you finish today, and it's my prayer that you will never forget today, because some of us are getting older, including me, we may never see each other again. But I pray we will not forget these nations. And even when we, we become old and we're not able to travel very far, and I have many older friends, many of them are confined to hospitals, some are confined to their own homes. One, not far from here, but would probably be here today, but he just broke his leg and he's not getting around too far, lives over there in Grove Park. But even when you don't have much left, you can pray for the peoples of the world. You can pray for the nations of the world. The whole OM story, there are three and a half thousand of us in OM and 90 nations. We've given the word of God to a thousand million. The Yanks say a billion people can be all traced back to one older praying woman. She may be unheard of in terms of human history, but she's the reason I'm here. God uses people. God uses prayer. And God wants to use your prayers to impact those ten nations and other nations of the world. Let us pray together. Our God and Father, we thank You. We thank You that You sent Your only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, I thank You for everyone gathered here this afternoon. I know there are people here with very special needs, with very special struggles in their own lives. And I pray that they may understand that You love them you care for them. And yet you also want them to have a vision for other people and other nations that they may not spend their life lived out in a whirlpool of selfishness and self-interest. But they would be your visionary people, your praying people, your people of action. For you have told us in your word not to be hearers of the word only, but doers. 
And as we go from this place, we want to be doers, praying, giving, going, sharing the vision with others, reaching out to people from these very nations who live right here in London, that we may be your men, that we may be your women. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you as you respond to this challenge. This challenge is not from me, my friends. This is not the message that I would choose. This is from God. And you will all stand. If you're a believer, you will stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ as a believer, and you will give account for what you've done concerning these ten nations and the suffering people of this world represented by this globe. God bless you.